<laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. I'm back. Couldn't escape me for too long. Actually, that's not true. Um, so, slight change of lecture schedule plan since the last time I said what was going on. Um, this is actually going to be my last lecture, and Jacob's going to take over for the rest of the course. Of course, as has been the case for the last couple weeks, I'll still be here, office hours, um, president lecture, all that stuff. So I'm not ceasing to exist, but this is my last day as the face of the class to you. Um, so what did you think of Pat's lecture, that style? I want to get just a quick straw poll of like, not straw poll, we won't do votes. I just, if anyone has any comments about that kind of style of lecture, I want to I'm interested in hearing them, yeah. I have to admit, I really like the test occasionally. It's nice to have a moment to think about it rather than just listen. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. Yeah. I also like the questions. I thought that when he saw that a lot of these were breaking the first questions. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly the same thing he was thinking in retrospect was uh, spent a little too much time at the warm ups at the beginning. Um, yeah, so I, I'm like philosophically in favor of that style. The problem is, as you noticed, we didn't quite make it through all the material. The way the class is currently structured is it's um, like there is a set of slides and every semester we make minor changes here and there, add some stuff, move, remove some stuff. But um, CS188 as a course, all the content is really packaged pretty nicely. And so it takes kind of an inordinate amount of effort to change a part of the course that much and still have it fit in with everything else. And so to that end, we didn't exactly have the uh, resources to try to implement something on that scale for the whole course. And today's lecture and probably most of Jacob's lectures are going to be, oh sorry, my iPad disconnected. I don't know what Jacob did to this thing. It stopped working ever since he took it. but. Uh, they're going to be more of the traditional format, but I'm going to make an effort to try to include more of these pauses to let you guys think about things and answer questions. And oh, I'm sure Jacob will have his um, opinion on that too and probably move in the same direction because I think that is a great change to the lecture format. Okay. Last note about that. The maximum likelihood waiting stuff at the end so there were two things we didn't really quite get to, which were maximum likelihood weighting and Gibbs sampling. We're going to cut Gibbs sampling. So um, if there are any current homework problems on it, we'll remove them. It won't be covered on the exams. So you're not responsible for that. We're not going to cut maximum likelihood. And as you might have seen, Jacob posted a link along with Pat's lecture video to an old lecture video that you could watch that goes through that. We want to be able to get on to the next part of the course, so I'm not going to really go over maximum likely, or likelihood weighted sampling right now, but you can get pretty much almost the full lecture experience from that. Uh, discussion sections yesterday and today probably talked about likelihood weighting quite a bit, and you'll get more practice with it before the exam. Okay, announcements about other stuff. So when I did feedback, my last lecture before this one, what the most common comment actually was, uh, um, it would be nice if there were solutions posted to the homework with explanations, because people are getting the answers right without actually understanding why. And in fact, that actually exists, but they only are visible after the homework is due. So I probably should have announced this way back at the beginning. It, didn't cross my mind, but if you go back to homeworks that have, the deadline is passed, there will be a show solution button that wasn't there before that will give you a pretty detailed explanation of why the question works out the way it does. And then other things, homework five, project four. Homework five came out last night. It's a pretty short one, which is good because we have a midterm coming up next week again. Surprise, it's only two weeks since the last one. Uh, that's the summer pace for you. But, um, if you're wondering, yeah, why it's due on Friday, isn't the project due the same day? We're going to push the project deadline back a couple days as well. I don't remember the exact date, but it'll be due later than Friday to give you some extra window after the exam to have time to work on that. 
And then last thing, project four is due this Friday. And maybe you've already started on it. Today is the last lecture that's going to talk about anything that is relevant to it. So if you haven't yet, today would be a good day to start on that. Any questions about any of this before we go on? Yeah? Will homework five be relevant to the exam? Um, I believe, so I probably should have the content title. So the exam will be up through this Thursday's lecture, and it's going to be next Wednesday. I actually don't remember off the top of my head what the content on homework five is, but if it's sampling, value of information, or hidden Markov models, then yes. If it's naive Bayes particle filtering or later, then no. Okay. Any other questions? OK. So today's topic is value of perfect information. And to get into this, the first thing we need to do is introduce yet another graphical model for how to approach problems. We've seen search trees, state transition, or um, state space graphs, Bayes nets, and uh, expect max trees, etc. We've seen all sorts of different things that we draw to represent a problem. And today we get one more new one. Outline, another popular demand from feedback is, so first we're going to talk about decision networks. And that's this new graphical model. Basically what we're going to do is take a Bayes net and add in a node where we're making some decision based on the assignment to the variables in the Bayes net. And then once we have that, it'll allow us to go to VPI, value of perfect information. And this is a calculation where we're trying to assess how valuable it is to do some kind of information gathering action as opposed to just acting on what we know right now. This is something that's come up a little bit before in reinforcement learning where we talked about um, you know, balancing exploitation versus exploration. Here we're going to make it even more explicit in that we're going to figure out a way to uh, assign a numerical value to what we gain from taking exploratory actions. And then we'll talk about some mathematical properties of this value and POMDPs. This is a way of generalizing both MDPs from, well, yeah, generalizing MDPs from before, where we had a state, we took an action, and we got a reward, and that affected our next state, etc. The difference now is we don't know the full state. We only get observations. And so we need a policy that is some function of the information we have. We do inference from that information to figure out what state or what distribution over states we think we're in, and based on that, we take an action. And yeah, it'll turn out that that's really, really difficult, not only conceptually, but also uh, in terms of complexity theory, like the rigorous definition of what it means to be hard. This is even harder than the stuff we were talking about last week with Bayes nets. It's P space complete, which is a step above NP complete. And yeah, we'll look at that at the end. So first thing, decision network. It looks like this. So here's an example problem we're going to be considering for a lot of today where down here we just have this section is a normal Bayes net. Two variables, weather and forecast. Weather can be sunny or rainy. Forecast can be good or bad. Really, it's sunny or rainy, but just so that it's clear we don't have names of variables conflicting, we're going to call this good forecast, bad forecast. And then up here we have something new. This is a choice we have to make, and it's whether or not we're going to take an umbrella with us when we go outside today. The best thing that could possibly happen is it's sunny and we don't take the umbrella. We can play beach volleyball and we don't have this thing that we have to drag around with us everywhere we go. Something that's a little more saddening is if it's sunny, we take the umbrella and we can't play the games because now we just have to watch our umbrella the whole time. It's, uh, yeah, it's a little weird, but um, here's the worst one right here is if it turns out that the weather is rainy, we go outside without an umbrella, then we get very wet. And this robot really doesn't like getting wet. Bad things happen to this robot if he gets wet. And this is something that's, you know, better than either of these, where we predicted wrong. Not quite as good as this. And it's, we took the umbrella, it rained, we were able to stay out of the rain. Now, what's important here is this isn't just a question of how likely are we to be correct. You know, 
running inference and being able to tell what's more likely out of whether or not it's going to rain. Now we're actually assigning utilities. Think back to expect max the first time we talked a lot about utilities to these various outcomes. And the fact that these two aren't equal means that it's not as simple as just choose the most likely outcome. We have to somehow weigh in our utilities as we make this decision. And that's what this last node is, is this is our utility function. And so this is an explicit function. Oops. Oh, oh no. An explicit function of whether or not we brought an umbrella and what the weather is. And we'll put numbers down in a minute, but basically this is going to, for the four possible assignments to these two variables, give us numbers that correspond to these scenarios here. So yeah, this is kind of what I was just saying. Um, putting this all down on a slide, we have what's happening? Okay. Oh wow. There's a delay. I don't know what Jake did. He ruined everything. Everything was working just fine last time. Not really. Everything was falling apart then too. Anyway, so like I said, we have these three kinds of nodes. Chance nodes are just like Bayes nets. They're variables, random variables that can take on some set of values. And actions are, they are going to behave kind of like observed variables in a Bayes net. But what they actually correspond to is some decision we have to make. Umbrella is a binary decision, yes or no, take the umbrella. It could be something more complicated than that, like what time are we going to drive to work, those kinds of things. It's not confined to just binary decisions. And then last is a utility node. In almost all of the examples we're going to see, there's one action node, a base net down here, and one node here that's going to point to the utility node along with the action, in which case utility is a function of its two parents, the action and one base net node. Generally speaking, we could also have more things down here, like where we where our friends decide we're going for the day or something like that that's going to also affect utility. And then, you know, the forecast probably affects that. All sorts of crazy stuff can happen here. But the one thing that's going to be consistent in this class, and this can be generalized, but we won't really see that. In this class, there will be one utility node, one decision to be made, and then just some arbitrary base net down here that points into the utility node. So the algorithm here for how to compute which value of the action is going to maximize our expected utility, same goal we've always had, is we instantiate all evidence. And so that's if I know that the forecast is bad, set this value to be observed, forecast equals bad. And then set the action nodes each possible way. Try yes, bring the umbrella. Compute the posterior for the parents of the utility node. Utility depends on weather, so we need to have a probability distribution over weather. Probability of weather given forecast equals bad. And then we calculate the expected utility. And even though we have all this new machinery visually, it's actually the exact same computation we've been doing all along. We just now have the utility function also depending on an action. So we plug in the expected value of utility of the action we've chosen, yes, and the weather. And that's given our evidence. And compute that. Do that for each action. Whichever action maximizes that, that's the one we pick. So it may not be super easy to see right now, but this is essentially identical to something we've already done with a slightly more complicated probability computation. Oh. Well, we'll get to that in a second. Before we get to that, let's actually do this with numbers. So rather than yes or no, we'll call it leave or take the umbrella. So if we leave behind the umbrella, this is that equation I wrote on the previous page, written out as a sum. The expectation of the utility is overall possible values of weather. And notice that we've simplified it now. We're not actually considering forecast. As of right now, we're taking this expectation over W, 
And when we calculate that sum, it's going to work out to 0.7, probability that it's sunny, times the utility of leaving the umbrella when it's sunny, which is 100, plus 0.3, the probability of rain, times the utility of leaving the umbrella when it rains, which is 0. Do that sum out, and it's 70. We do the same thing again for taking the umbrella, set our variable umbrella to take, and we have this. Again, the expectation of the utility. This time, we're setting the action to be take in all of these. And it's the same thing again. It's going to be 0.7 times the utility of sun and take umbrella, plus 0.3 times the utility of rain and take the umbrella. When we do that, we get 35. So the optimal decision, now that we've compared the expected utility of our two actions, which are leave and take the umbrella, is to leave the umbrella. And, you know, if you just looked at these and didn't really do the math out, that's not too surprising, given that there's a big utility here for leaving it behind when there's sun, and sun is the more likely outcome. Of course, we haven't taken into account a forecast yet. There's not really any way we could gather information and make a more informed decision yet, but we'll get there. So, this is notation that we're going to start using today. MEU, and then what's right in here is this is the evidence observed. In this case, we didn't observe any evidence before making this computation, so that's just an empty set. We could also later add something like, we saw that the forecast is bad right here. Then we're making the computation maximum expected utility after we have that evidence. But for now, this. So, like I was saying a minute ago, this is very similar to something we've seen before. Think of this expect a max tree. So here we have a choice node, two chance nodes, and then utility nodes right here. These are leaves where we know what the value is going to be. For the example we just saw, what we did was consider the two actions we can take. For each of those, compute an expectation over the utility, given that we took that action, and the random outcome was that, that value, sun take sun, utility of take sun. This is actually exactly the same as running expect max in this small tree. The only thing that's different is we have added the capacity to observe evidence. And we haven't actually used it here. So for this example, they're identical. But notice I have this empty set floating around here. When we, when we add the information that we're going to gain, the forecast, this is actually going to be a set of evidence, and then that's going to affect what these probabilities are. To affect the probabilities of the, or sorry, to compute the probabilities of these outcomes, in general, remember this is coming from a decision network that has just some BaysNet slapped on at the bottom. And so this is just inference in a BaysNet, you know, variable elimination, sampling, these algorithms we've seen that tell you, given the evidence you have, what's the probability distribution over one, some other variable here? we are just going to care about whichever one is pointing into the utility node. So let's look at the example with the forecast variable added in. Um, again, we're going to need to set the action variable to both of these values and compute the maximum expected utility. This time, it's conditioned on the outcome of the forecast. Here we've said, suppose we observe that the weather forecast is bad. If that's the case, then here's a difference in notation. Now we're calculating expected utility of leave given bad. And here's where that actually makes a difference, is before this was just probability of W. Now we have to condition on this and compute the posterior distribu distribution given that evidence, P of W given bad. So that step's kind of been skipped here, but Notice that this Bayes net is defined where we will have a table P of W and P of F given W. We've, we've skipped a step here, already applied Bayes rule, and gotten this table, probability of W given F. So to fill in the value over here, we just take the probability from here. And it's going to work out the same way as before, but with different numbers. We have this sum where 34 is the probability 
of sun given our evidence, and 66 is the probability of rain given our evidence. And then do the same thing again for the other value of the action. Same probabilities. The utilities are what have changed now. Remember, 20 is coming from taking the umbrella when it's sunny, and 70 is taking the umbrella when it's rainy. And our optimal decision has changed. And again, intuitively, this is not surprising. From before, we had that with no information, it's probably better to leave the umbrella behind. But if we have the weather forecast telling us it's likely to rain, that's going to affect how we make a decision. Now it's much more likely that taking the umbrella is going to turn out to be worthwhile. And so here's the notation, how that looks in this case. Now instead of an empty set right here, we have the, here it's just one. In general, we could have a set of more than one piece of observed evidence. But we have that the forecast equals bad. And then, again, EU of whatever action given that evidence. We can do the outcome tree, the expect max tree again. And it looks a little bit different. Still the same setup. One choice being made. One layer of chance nodes. So one random outcome. And then utilities at the bottom. What's different is now this isn't an empty set. We've observed the bad forecast. And so now these probabilities right here, probabilities of the different outcomes for weather, are different now that we're conditioning on that. So it's actually the same process again, expect a max, if we were to assume that we already had these probabilities. It's just now we need an algorithm that tells us how to compute those probabilities. Turns out that algorithm is really one we've already learned, inference. And that's what we saw on this slide right here. This was a pretty simple example. This is just Bayes' rule, which is flipping around a conditional. In general, if we had other stuff coming out right here, maybe something pointing in like that, and we observed some of those but not all of them, then the inference could become more and more difficult, more and more like the variable elimination kind of queries that you saw a few lectures ago. But the point is, this is something we already know how to do. And once we do have that, it's just like a one-step expected next computation. So I'm going to stop now. First, I want to ask, are there any questions about what we've seen so far? Yeah. So we've pretty much just been using inference to develop a expect max chance node? Yeah, essentially. Um, you may not find that the most useful intuition. If that's the case, really what we're doing is the utility depends on a random variable. We need to take an expectation. And that's given some evidence. And in order to find the probabilities for that expectation, we need to do inference. Whether you like to think of that as expectant max is kind of you know, personal preference. If you like having the tree as a way of outlining the computation, I know that for myself, that's not the way I thought of it for a long time, and it is now, so I can see either being preferable. But the point is, you need to know those probabilities. Any other questions? OK. In that case, this is the first time we're going to stop, and I'm going to ask you a question. So remember the Ghostbusters demo we saw a couple times? This is actually going to be what Project 5 is based on. So you haven't dealt with this code yet. But what we were doing is there's some hidden ghost. We can't see it. But we can search in specific positions on the board. There's a grid. Maybe I should just bring that up. Yeah, I'll do that. OK, so we have this grid. And starting out, we have no idea where the ghost is. A priori, it's just uniformly distributed over all of these squares, but we're able to click somewhere and get an observation. This observation corresponds to a noisy reading of how far away the ghost is from that click, from that square. It doesn't tell us what direction, and it doesn't tell us with certainty how far away it is. Yellow means it's, I don't remember the exact ranges, but green means it's far away, like more than five squares. Yellow means it's within three to four, orange is one to two, and red is it's right here. 
but there can be errors in all of those. So none of them give us, you know, for sure outcomes. So if we're trying to find this ghost, the decision we're making over and over is like, where can we click that's going to give us a good idea of where the ghost is? It's somewhere over here. And what's happening to compute these probabilities, this is actually the inference that we saw before, where it's running variable elimination over the base net of what all these variables look like, how they relate to each other. And as of now, we're just kind of randomly guessing where we should look. And we're not having great luck. Is it up here? Nope. Ah, okay, it's probably right there. At this point, it's probability 0.98, that that is where the ghost is. So we can just try that out, bust. Okay, we hit it. So, yeah, this is a flashback to a demo we saw before. And now the question is, for this problem, how could we set this up as a decision network? And we're going to simplify it a little bit. It's just for one step here. Um, the decision is whether or not to bust, to say, OK, I know where the ghost is. It's right here. And then the base net is going to be just all of the variables that are present in that example. So I want to give you about a minute, talk to your partners, think about what this is actually going to look like, this decision network for that problem. <coughs> All right, let's bring it back in. So I kind of already said this, but what's the first thing that we're going to put on here, right at the top? Bust. Yeah. And I think I said the decision is whether or not to bust right now. Minor mistake, it's actually where we want to bust. That's the decision we're making. Um, so <clears throat> we have that variable, the choice we're making. What's next, right after that? Utility, right? And so, of course, our utility is going to depend on, <coughs> excuse me, on our choice of action. And it's also going to depend on some random variables. So this is kind of the big question, is what's down here? And out of those, what points up to the utility node? So does anyone want to describe what that'll look like? Yeah. Check for all, all the highest value points you can put on. And uh, if and I suppose it would be if the distance from the most valuable node is less than the, the greatest distance from one hundred percent. Check for boss. Okay, so you're getting to some of the important stuff, which is you know basically that kind of reasoning is what's going to happen when we run inference and do the computation. We want a Bayes net that actually just lays out the relationships between all of these variables. So what are the variables, first of all? The squares? Yeah, and specifically, it's you know, all of the sensor readings. 
And we're going to observe some of these, and some of them will not be observed. But what's important is we have sensor 1, 1. And then I won't write sensor again every time, but you know we have a whole grid of them like this. And that'll go on and on this way, on and on this way, that big grid. And then is there anything else? What are we doing inference over? What probability distribution are we trying to figure out in that demo that I showed? Yeah, exactly, is where is the ghost? So that's the last piece, ghost position. And then what's the relationship between these? Well, it's the way we've set up that sensor model. I said I didn't give the exact probabilities, but you know, if where we clicked is however far away from the ghost, then this color is most likely, which means we've defined a conditional distribution on sensor readings based on the ghost position. And then there will be those connected to every single reading. And then what points into utility? Right, just ghost position. And that's because our utility for busting at the exact same position where the ghost is, is some big positive amount, it's 250. And then for busting in the wrong place, that's zero. So that's you know, a well-defined function in terms of these two inputs. This is the first example we've seen now of something big down here. This is a much more complicated base net than weather. Anything we'll have you doing out by hand is going to be, it's going to look more like weather. But when you get to the VPI question in Project 4, it's a more general treatment where we're trying to connect the inference algorithms that we've already learned and when you do the project have already implemented to solve queries in this framework. And exactly what kind of query we care about is value of information. Now talking about value information in context of the demo we just saw is suppose that for every observation we take we get minus one point. You know it wouldn't be that interesting a game if that weren't the case. We just click every single place and then we'd know where to go. But if there's some cost to exploring, then we have to make a decision at every time step. Is now the time to guess where the ghost is, or do I want to gather more information? And when we were doing that, when I was just working through that, I was, it was pretty ad hoc. It was like, OK, the probability is pretty high. I have fairly high confidence of where it is, so I'm just going to click now. This is an algorithm that we're going to look at for first computing explicitly what the value of gathering more information is, and then from that, coming up with whether or not we should. And essentially, it's going to come down to, for the Pac-Man example, if the value of the information of one more reading is more than one, which is the cost for taking that reading, then we should keep exploring. If the value of the information is less than one, then we should just guess right now. So. Have that example as motivating in the back of your mind if it helps. Here's a simpler one, um, really getting right to the point of value inf of information. So we can do it directly from the decision network. The problem set up here is we're buying oil drilling rights. We're going to set up the, the decision network like this. And this is going to be a very simplified example. There are just two blocks, A and B. We can buy the rights to drill at A or the rights to drill at B. One of them will have oil and the other doesn't. We don't know which one. The distribution right here on oil location is just half and half. So, yeah, prior probability is 0.5 each. Throw those tables up. And what we have over here, of course, in order for the utility to be well defined, we need to have some amount assigned to each outcome here. This is sensible. If we buy the, long, the wrong location to drill, utility is zero. If we buy the right location, it's K. So drilling in either A or B has expected utility K over 2. Right? If we choose to drill at A with no information, probability half, we've chosen the right position, utility K. Probability half, we've chosen the wrong position, utility 0. Their average is K over 2. So the maximum expected utility, that's maximum over our choice of actions, 
of the of the, that same value that we just calculated is k over 2. Doesn't matter which action we pick, k over 2 is what we get. And now the question is what's the value of information of O? And when I say O, that's this random variable, oil location. That's the form this query is going to take. Is for some variable in the base net, one of these chance nodes in the decision network, the value of information of that is the change in our expect, maximum expected utility if we were to actually know what that's going to be assigned to. It's no longer random, we observe it. So before we keep clicking through this, let's think about what we expect to happen here. If oil location is A, we don't know that. We choose with no information, expected utility K over 2. If we know that oil location is A, then of course we're going to choose to drill at A, which is going to have utility K. So our gain in maximum expected utility is K over 2, and that's going to be the value of perfect information about oil location. Yeah. Another way we'll frame this is fair price of information. There's one big long discussion question you'll do where it's, do you want to pay for a certain kind of test? What is the monetary value of that test? And it'll work out exactly the same way. But yeah, so that's the kind of query we want to answer. What is the value in terms of our utility function of knowing this as opposed to treating it as random? So let's take this back to the weather example. And of course, we saw this already. Maximum expected utility with no evidence. MEU of empty set is 70. That was that first computation we did. And then the maximum expected utility, if the forecast is bad, is um, 53. That's another computation we already saw. This is something we didn't see. MEU if forecast is good. I'm just giving you the number. Works out the exact same way in terms of how you compute that. 95. And now the question we want to ask is, if I put these two distributions up here, this shouldn't be showing yet. Don't look at that. That's a distraction. Um, yeah, we're going to stop and think about this again. So we have this full base net. Now it's not just the graph. We actually have specified these two distributions. And we want to figure out somehow from these three numbers the value of information. So I haven't really rigorously set down a definition for you unless you managed to read that before I scratched it out. But I want you to take a minute, again, talk to the people near you if you want to. Think about from these what we want to do to somehow get a number for that value of information. You, does anyone have any questions about what these correspond to? Okay, then yeah, talk amongst yourselves for a minute.
OK, so I just want to get ideas going around the room. So raise your hand if you came up with a sensible way to synthesize these three numbers into one meaningful summary of the value of this information. That was too many words. Just whatever you came up with. Yeah. 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 That's a great idea. Um, a lot of times people will come up with other things, and maybe some of you did, of um, summing these together or um, taking the total difference, things like that. And those all are some kind of meaningful measure. But the one that's going to be most useful to us, and we'll see why as we look at a few examples later, is taking the difference between no evidence and observed evidence. So this difference right here would be minus 17, and this difference would be 25, plus 25. Those are the two potential values of that information after we find out what that information is. And we want to know the expected value of the information, right? The variable that we're going to observe, forecast, can take on values bad or good. And if it takes on bad, this is what we get. And if it takes on good, this is what we get. So let's compute an expectation. Where do we get those probabilities? Our first question, what probabilities do we use for the expectation? Yeah. Yeah, so the, I mean, the first thing we need to compute is what is the probability that forecast is good? In general, that's not necessarily part of our base net. And in fact, we have an example right here where it's not. This is something where, again, we have to do a little bit of inference, right? Um, well, not inference with evidence. But in this case, we have to do some combining of these two things we have, probability of w and probability of f given w, to compute the marginal distribution over the variable that we're taking an expectation over. The variable we're taking an expectation over is f. And so the table we need to compute is p of f. That's a little small there, but you know the way that we get p of f is sum over w of p of w times p of f given w. Hopefully, that's not a controversial statement, and things like that you're getting pretty comfortable with. We multiply these two together, get the joint distribution, sum out w, and what we have is just a probability distribution over the forecast. And these probabilities that come from that are what we use to take an expectation. And now, well, okay, I have to just start undoing everything because I had no eraser and I want to show the equation at the bottom. So while I'm doing that, um, okay, there we go. The computation to be made here is actually going to look kind of similar to what we already did. So 0.59, that's the probability that the forecast is good. And rather than actually directly using those differences, we can equivalent, equivalently subtract 70 out outside of the expectation. And if we do that, then it's probability that forecast is good times the maximum expected utility of our, the maximum expected utility given that evidence, which is 53, sorry, 95. And then we're adding probability that the forecast is bad times the maximum expected utility once we have that evidence. We do that, we get this value, which is going to be equal to maximum expected utility of the evidence, and then we're subtracting out maximum expected utility with no evidence. This thing at the bottom, don't worry if it's a lot of math thrown at you all of a sudden. We're going to look at it in depth a bit more on the next slide. But what I want to get at here is that this is a more general version where we say maybe we already have some evidence given to us. So 
one example you could consider is maybe this is the forecast that's coming from the weather channel and then over here we also have what Google's going to tell you if you look up what the internet is. Now there's more than one variable and we could have this already observed. We already know the internet forecast and the query we're answering now is what is the value of given that we already know that and in this setup that's going to be E, the thing we already know, what's the value of the thing that we might observe? And that's going to be E prime. So value of perfect information of E prime given what we already know E is the expectation over the distribution this imposes over E prime. So if we know that the internet um, yeah, if we know that the internet forecast is bad, it's going to rain, that gives us some information about what the forecast from the news is going to be. Not perfect information. It's perfect information about this, not this. And so that imposes some distribution, you know, news forecast conditioned on internet forecast. We can compute those probabilities again by the inference that we've seen again and again. And then we compute these two values and take the expectation of their difference. Equivalently, this value right here is a constant with respect to E prime, the thing we're taking an expectation over. So we can subtract it out. That's right here. And then this is actually expanding out the definition of expectation as a sum. This is the version we're mostly going to work with right here. And, you know, this is like the definition to have on your cheat sheet, big equation. Um, sorry, I've scratched all over it, it's a little messy, but this is pretty important. So, yeah, let's, let's break that equation down into smaller pieces. We built up to it, we're gonna look at all the pieces kind of on their own again first. So, assume we already have evidence E equals E. If we act now, we get no more evidence, What's our maximum expected utility with the current evidence? That's MEU of E, and this is what it's equal to. Max over the actions we can take, the expectation of the utility as a result of that. We can break down the expectation as the sum again. Sum over all of the S is uh, the variable that's pointing into utility, the variables that are parents of utility. Sum are over, over all the possible outcomes for those, their probabilities, times the utility. So that's MEU with no extra evidence. If we see that the variable E prime gets some specific value, lowercase e prime, then this is the new notation. It's MEU of not just E, but E and E prime. And probably unsurprisingly, it looks exactly the same, except that the evidence and the probability now is both E and E prime. But if we already knew what E prime was, we wouldn't be talking about trying to figure, it out, or figure out the value of observing E prime. We already have it. The real query we're trying to answer is we don't know E prime. We're taking an expectation. And so we need some new notation for that. We're, or not necessarily. But we introduce new notation because this is something we'll see enough that we want to abbreviate a little. The expected value, if E prime is revealed and then we act, it's going to be written like this. MEU of lowercase e, so that's evidence that's already assigned. Capital E prime, that's evidence that will be assigned. We're taking the expectation over all those possible outcomes. And that's exactly this. Sum over all the possible E primes, the probability of that E prime, given what we already know, times MEU E E prime. That's just coming from right here. And then we finally get to the last point, which is value of information. And specifically, we're going to call it value of perfect information. We'll draw a distinction about why we're calling it that a little bit later. VPI is just that difference between the expectation of, of observing the new variable minus the maximum expected utility if we don't. One useful way of conceptualizing this is to look back at the expectamax tree that we looked at at the beginning of this lecture. So the first one we saw 
we weren't really considering, do I want to look at this evidence or not? It was just, this is the, or I guess this was the second one we saw. This is the evidence we already have, plus E. In that example, it was forecast is bad. And we're making a choice. Then there's a random outcome. Then there are utilities. Looks like this. The next thing down, which corresponds to this equation right here, is if we know what the value of E prime is, then we've changed the evidence in this set right here, and that's conditioned on right here to calculate these probabilities. And that's also going to happen on the other side. This is something a little bit different. Now we have a chance node at the top, then a choice to be made, then another layer of chance nodes, then utilities. And where is this coming from? Well, again, we start with already knowing the value of lowercase e, of just normal e. So that's in the known evidence at the top node. But we're considering the random outcome of what we observe from e prime. So that's what this first chance node is. It branches because e prime could be plus e prime or minus e prime. After that value is observed, if we get plus e prime, we land in this subtree, which looks exactly like this. This is given that we have observed that e prime is plus e prime. We're going to do the exact same kind of one step expect max computation as before. Alternatively, we might observe that the value of e prime is minus e prime, and then we're in this subtree. And what's critical here is that these are two different decisions we can now make. Given what we find out at this top level, we now have an opportunity based on that information to decide what the optimal action is separately for the various outcomes. So there's kind of a first stab at intuition for why this is an improvement for us, why we would always expect observing more evidence to increase our value. This is the basic idea, is that if we don't have evidence, then it looks like this. And that kind of corresponds to being forced to choose the same action, regardless of what E prime is going to be. Down here, if we are given that evidence, then we can base our decision off of that. In a second, we're going to look at a more rigorous proof of why this is always going to be, why it'll always be valuable to get information. You'll never have negative value of perfect information. But before I go to that, I want to ask, are there any questions about anything on this slide so far? Okay. In that case, first thing I want to do, throw this definition back up. BPI is that difference. And here's the tree that was at the bottom on the last slide, stretched out a little bit. And here's a different version of the first tree. And what have I done differently here? Before, on the previous slide, we had one chance node right here that split into utility outcomes. One chance node right here. But what's actually happening is if we've split all of the random variables into E and E prime, or in this case we can simplify it and just say those are the only random variables, E and E prime. We could do what we had on the previous um, slide, which looked... Uh -oh. Regret already. I have to flip through the whole thing. But yeah, so we had that top tree right there where this chance node is going to tell us the outcome of S, whatever variable affects our utility. Down here, we have first a variable that's going to first a variable that's going to tell us the outcome of E prime, and then based on that, a variable that's going to tell us the outcome of S. To compute the probabilities in the previous tree, probability of S based on E, the computations are actually going to be the same as if we were to do it in this tree. You just have to basically do more steps as Bayes net inference 
versus here we're kind of breaking it down into two expectations. If you're not quite following that, don't worry about it. The point is, in order to figure out the expected utility here, we are going to have to consider all of the variables in the BaseNet, in particular E prime. So I've broken this into two steps. So this is what M E U, no, I won't write it out. This is what this looks like, and this is what this looks like. The difference here is that we've interchanged these two layers. And what does that mean? Well, you can imagine if you're playing a game where one person is trying to say what number you're thinking of, and then so they say a number and you say, yes, that was my number, or no, it wasn't. But you say what number you were thinking of. They say 43, you say, no, it was 68. If you slip, flip around the order of the turns, you say, I'm thinking of the number 68. And now it's their turn to pick a number. It's a lot better for them. That's an easier game. And that's kind of what's happening here, is if the random node, which remember, thinking back to expect max, sometimes it's useful to think of this as some random player in a game acts first, then you can react based on that and have more say in what you want to do. Whereas if you have to act first, you're forced to choose regardless of what they're going to do. So there are two different intuitions for it. And I'm going to kind of just breeze through the next slide. There's a lot of math. Don't freak out. Um, hopefully the intuition is there. But this is a proof more for your reference, because I find that people have a hard time being convinced that VPI is non-negative. And so this is here for you to come back to if you're worried about it later. So first, all those definitions from a previous slide. This equation just comes from combining these two. Sorry, not those two. These two. And we get that. And then this, we have, that's going to go right there. We've done, hopefully, a slightly familiar inference step here from variable elimination, where uh, if we were to combine these two factors, p of e prime given e, s given e, e prime, and then sum out e prime, we just get this. And then we can factor that out because it doesn't depend on s. That's how we get this second equation. And then this is just a definition step. I'm saying whatever action maximizes this value, name it A star E, the optimal action given evidence E. And so now we have MEU of E is equal to this value. VPI is equal to the difference between this thing and this thing. Plugging those two in, it's for both of them, they start out with a sum over P E prime given over E prime weighted by P E prime given E. So we can again factor that out, and then it's this difference right here of what's inside that sum. One more step of just kind of uh, factoring sums because this whole value right here is constant with respect to A. There's no problem if we move this whole thing inside the max, factor out p of s e comma e prime, and we end up with this equation. I went through a lot of that pretty fast, um, especially probably some of this stuff up here. If variable elimination is still sinking in, that's not a step you believe me about just yet. That'll come in a few days as it's pounded into your head with the homework and everything. Um, but the point is, we've gotten it down to this form. And if you can believe me that this is equivalent to this, here's a proof. But if you believe me, this is a constant value. This is a value that we're choosing from the set of possible actions that's going to maximize this whole thing. And in particular, this action right here, the constant A star E, that is one of the choices that we have for what can go right here. Which means, at worst, the maximizing action for this quantity right here is also, also A star E, in which case this whole thing is zero, and we get VPI equals zero. But if observing evidence 
changes what the optimal action is going to be, then this, is a, this value right here is actually going to be bigger than this constant value. Now that we've observed the evidence, the action that we choose is different because it maximizes expected utility conditioned on that evidence. And so this, in the worst case, is zero. In the case where actions change, it's positive. And that means that, in general, this whole sum has to be non-negative. Okay. So that will be there for you to look back at. Um, I think this is another summer pace thing where we just barely covered variable elimination and it's very key to everything that we're going to do today and especially the next two days. So you probably will have to come back and look at some of the proofs for this before the midterm. Hopefully having that laid out on the slide is helpful. But I want to get to a couple other properties. We're not going to prove any of these other ones quite as rigorously, but hopefully you have an intuition for them. First was non-negative. That's what we just saw. The next one is non-additive. So you can think about, um, in the weather example, if we observe the forecast, then we also observe the forecast again. Of course, the value of those two observations is not going to be the sum of the individual values, because the extra observation of the forecast the second time gives us no more information. So in general, this is not true although there are some cases where it can be. And then the other one is order independent. And this is, if we're talking about, consider again the um, weather example with two forecasts, the internet and the weather channel. If we're going to observe both of those, then the order that we observe both of them doesn't actually matter. This is that written out as a mathematical statement, but hopefully, that's kind of intuitive. So I just threw a lot of stuff at you. Um, are there any questions about any of these three properties? I imagine there probably are about this one. Non-negative Yeah? Um, so the non-negative, uh, like Oh, sorry. Do you want me on that same slide? This? this, this? this? OK. Um, a star yes. Is Uh, yeah, so in usually there will be options where it's worse, but that's kind of um, the key next step once we get it consolidated into this form is that this A star E that's fixed as the best action given no evidence. That's a constant, whereas the action that we're choosing, there may be more actions that are even worse, but we're maximizing. We get to choose out of all the actions which one is the best one. Since this is one of our choices, we can definitely do at least this well by just choosing A equals A star E. There are probably ones that are worse, but the worst possible best one is A star E. We know that this exists, and it's possible we can do even better. There might be a stronger intuition coming from this comparison. Um, I wouldn't dwell too much on the proof at this point if that's not the easiest way for you to conceptualize it. For a lot of people who like to see sums and maxes and bounds, this is probably more convincing. But I think the order of decisions to be made is probably a stronger intuition for why it's not negative. Any other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I 
Yeah, great question. So we're going to run these computations, and it's going to tell us, in most cases, it's never negative. And in most cases, there is some positive value to come from this. And if gathering information is free, then for, that re for exactly that reason, yes, we're always going to want to gather information. This gives us a framework for weighing the cost of gathering that information versus its value. So like the Pac-Man example was, um, you know, every observation you take costs one point. If you were to guess right right away, you get 250. If you guess right after 20 observations, you get 230. This gives us a way to actually maximize our expected utility with that extra decision of how much more information do we want to also be made. Okay. Um, I want to say a couple interesting things about this middle point, non-additive. I, I mentioned that it's not equal, but sometimes it is. Let's think about a case where the VPI, well, I gave you an example of the VPI of observing two things is less than their sum. That was if you're observing the same thing. Um, another one would be like if you have the two different forecasts. If you already know uh, the news forecast, and it looks like this, I'll just say I for internet, weather, utility, I'll leave out the other part of it. But it looks like this. If you already know the news, then observing the internet, assuming this is actually the model, or a good model of how these variables relate, is not going to give us any more information about W. Right? Given news, I is independent of W. That's a deseparation again. But what about um, an example where they're equal? Think about that for a minute. We want some setup of random variables and utility based on those of an example where the VPI of observing two random variables is equal to the sum of observing them independently, like this. So just take 30 seconds. I'll cut you off pretty soon, but think about that for a minute. 30 seconds. Okay, any ideas? I kind of gave a hint in the way I, were, I phrased the question. And I said, the value of observing them together is the same as observing them independently. No? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they need to be independent. And specifically, a good example to think of is, what if your uh, decision network looked like this? This is a little bit of a contrived example, but hopefully the point comes across. You have some action that you're going to take, and it doesn't actually matter what your action is. You have two random variables over here, x1, x2, and actually no, sorry, it does matter what your action is. We'll get to that in a second. x1 and x2 are coin flips, heads or tails, and your utility comes from guessing what it's going to land on correctly. If you guess correctly, one point. If you guess incorrectly, zero points. Well, the VPI of observing x1 is before you had half a point expectation coming from that, because you had to guess heads or tails and you had no idea. Now it's one. So you gain, you go from expected utility half to one. And then same thing happens over here. If you observe them jointly, they don't actually interact with each other in any meaningful way. So these two are going to be equal. This last point is a little bit harder to come by, so I'm not going to make anyone try to guess it. But it is actually possible for this to be greater also. And the example there is if, again, say action is you're just trying to guess some outcome of a random variable. And 
the random variable is the XOR of two other ones. So we, we again have our two coin flips, X1 and X2, 0, 1, XOR. And we're trying to guess XOR. That depends our, or that determines our utility. I'll call it guess. A little sloppy. But observing X1, no information, right? Because if this is 0, this could still be 0 or 1, and that completely determines XOR. Observing X2 separately, again, no information. But if we know both, that fully determines XOR, and so we're able to figure out U. So we've seen examples to less than, greater than, equal to. In general, adding up information can be pretty complicated and depends on a lot of weird stuff like that. So we're going to just breeze through these. Quick VPI questions. Those should be coming one at a time, but they're not. So the first question is, the soup of the day is either clam chowder or split pea, but you wouldn't order either one. What's the value of knowing which it is? Zero. Yeah, exactly. Intuitively, that just, who cares, right? You don't care what kind of soup they're selling if you're not going to buy it either way. But thinking kind of back to the math that we saw about this, this would be that case where no matter what you observe, your action's not going to change. And so that term left over in the middle is going to be zero. Next question is, there are two kinds of plastic forks at a picnic. One kind is slightly sturdier. What's the value of knowing which? No numbers here, but, uh, you know, the idea is, like, this is not a big deal. The difference is, in the utilities are pretty small here, because if, you're, if you have a bunch of plastic forks, one of them breaking is probably not a big deal. So the point of this is, okay, those aren't coming in the right order, but the point of this is, the value of information is going to exist in the same units, on the same scale, as the utilities that you're talking about. In Pac-Man, it's Pac-Man's score. In the case of forks breaking or not, it's like if a fork breaking gives you minus 0 0.01 utility or something like that, the utility of, oh, no, I have to grab the other fork. Now I've used two forks. Then the VPI is probably going to be pretty small. If you care a lot about not breaking forks, then that's going to go up correspondingly. And then the last question, you're playing the lottery. The prize is for getting the wrong number is zero, for getting the right number is 100. And you can play any number between 1 and 100. What is the value of knowing the winning number? This is kind of like that, you say a number and then I'll guess your number example before. This is maximum expected utility with no evidence is um, $1. Right, a hundred dollars times the probability of winning, which is one over a hundred. And if we know the winning number, then again, it's a hundred dollars times the probability of winning. Well, assuming we take the maximizing action, what's the probability of winning? One, right? And so we get that. Here, the maximum expected utility is. Well, flip them around, but $99, or the VPI, excuse me, is $99. Uh, these kinds of calculations are probably the easiest to see, like, why we want more information. This is your BaseNet has one variable, and you observe that variable or you don't. But in general, what we have is kind of a noisier version of this exact scenario. So let's talk about that idea, noisiness. So I've been calling this VPI, value of perfect information. And you might be wondering, I can observe the weather, but what if my sensor is wrong? Or what if the person who tells me the weather lies to me? Or any of these things that could lead to me not actually getting perfect information, right? I get the wrong outcome for some random variable. The answer is no such thing. And what I mean by that is our model handles that but not by accounting for the possibility of one of our random variables, one of our pieces of evidence, being wrong. Instead, we have evidence meaning, for sure, this variable is going to be assigned to this. And to account for noisy data, or in any other way, the possibility that our reading might be wrong, our observation might be wrong, we just have to add 
more variables to our base net. So for example, if you're trying to decide whether to clean, there's utility, and the question is, is your friend coming over? Well, your observation, you might think, is your friend calls and says they're coming over, and so this is true, that affects your decisions. If you're modeling it in a way that's going to account for the possibility that your friend calls you and says they're coming over and then they don't, what you need to do is add another variable over here, which is friend calls. This, we know for sure, we can observe and say is true or false. If we can define this model, all these probabilities, given that my friend called and said they're coming over, what's the probability they're actually going to come over? Then we can use exactly the same framework. Still call this perfect information. It's just perfect information about a noisy variable in terms of its relationship to what we care about. And do the same kind of thing. Questions about that? Yeah. C is, oh yeah, clean room. But point is, it's, you know, you might want to clean up because your friend's coming over. More generally, something that depends on what the value of this variable is. Okay. Okay. I don't know. I get weird bugs like this in my slide. That's part of a line that's going to show up at the end of the slide. Just don't worry about it for right now. Um, okay. So we're going to expand the drilling example a little bit. I'm going to breeze through this too. So now we're not actually going to know the oil location. What we're going to find out is some combination of these three random variables. We've expanded the model to account for more stuff, noisy observations. We have a few scouts that we could hire to uh, do this. And actually the way that we're going to model this is we hire some agency to send a scout to try to figure out where the oil is, and then they randomly select one of their agents, one of their scouts. And then down here we have the outcome of their report, which is, you know, the oil is probably at A or the oil is probably at B. So we're not going to put any numbers on it this time, but the, the point here is to see how what we already know about Bayes nets relates to VPI in an example like this. So VPI of oil location, that's what we computed before. That was that K over 2. Because it was uncertain before, completely certain now. And so it's the difference between the expectation versus just guessing the right thing for sure. VPI of scouting report. So no numbers again, but we want to try to compare it to... We know 0 is a lower bound because VPI is never less than zero. And so the two questions are, is it positive? So distinguishing between it's equal to zero or it's greater than zero? That's one question. And then is it less than, equal to, or greater than k over two up here? So first question. Assuming a reasonable model here where all these things are related the way you'd expect them to be, is VPI scouting report zero or positive? I hear some mumblings positive. Yeah, exactly. Because what we're saying there is the outcome of the scouting report is going to give us some information about where the oil lies. We have some professional going out and telling us from their professional opinion it's more likely to be here. That raises the probability that it's there. Um, something, oh, I skipped one of those two questions. The other one is compared to k over 2. Is it less than, equal to, or greater than? Less than, yeah. So the reason it's less than is oil location is all the information we need to compute the utility. If we have this, then we can with certainty maximize utility. The only way this could be equal to that is if that were also true here. But again, a reasonable model accounts for the possibility that the scout makes an error. So this is going to give us some smaller amount of information about oil location, smaller than certainty, and thus it will increase our expected utility less. Next question is VPI scout. So this is a bit weirder. 
now we're saying we don't know what the result of their scouting run was. We just know who went out to do the run. What does that tell us? Or maybe the question I should be asking, zero or positive? Positive? Zero? Raise your hand for positive. We get a few, zero? Okay, looks like most people abstained. We have like three on each side. That's good. Okay, well, so there are two ways to approach this. The first is just kind of thinking about it. The real world analog, the problem we're trying to solve with this model. Um, you might be thinking that if there's a scout that has more reliable information they can give us, then we'd want to know which scout goes out. But remember that you're implicitly, if you word it that way, you're saying, we know which scout went out and what they told us. If we only know who's going to go out and measure the ground, not what they measured, that doesn't tell us anything. So for that reason, not totally rigorous. It's going to be equal to zero. Here's the mathematical reasoning here. Remember independence. This is the common effect triple. When the thing in between is not observed, these two are independent, which means scout, oil location, they're independent. And what independence means is observing scout does not change our belief about oil location. The distribution over oil location conditioned on scout is just the same as if we hadn't observed anything at all. So for that reason, VPI here is zero. But this is that weird triple where if we do observe what's down here, then they become related. And that's probably kind of the mindset people who said yes were in, is suppose we know the result of that scouting report, which is the scout came back and said, um, the oil's probably at A. If there are junior employees and senior employees, and the senior employees are almost always right, and the junior employees are almost always wrong, then knowing who's telling you that is actually going to matter. And there's the wishy-washy intuitive talk about real world. Talking about uh, independence, these now are related. By the same deseparation algorithm, we no longer can say they're independent once we condition on the thing in the middle. So we're going to have that this is greater than zero. And of course, for the same reason as up here, if our model is sensible and everyone doesn't know perfectly everything, then it's also going to be less than k over 2. It's still some noisy information about where the oil is. So there's a general result, is if what we're observing, what we're computing the value of observing is independent of the parents of the utility, the BaseNet variables that actually matter for calculating our utility, then the value of observing them is zero. That independence means they give us actually no meaningful information about what we want to know about. So I'm already over time, but that's okay, because in reality, at this point of the lecture, or of the lectures, you don't have to really be able to reason about POMDPs. POMDPs are, like I said, an MDP, but instead of knowing the full state, you just have observations. You don't know actually what state the environment's in, you just know some piece of information about it. You're going to see hidden Markov models starting tomorrow, and that's, um, well, there's a lot to say about that. And a POMDP is essentially combining a hidden Markov model with an MDP. There will be more to be said about POMDPs starting tomorrow. So I'm going to skip this whole setup right here. You'll see it again. And go just straight to the example. Basically what we're doing is expanding the one-step VPI calculation into a more general question of do I want to take an information gathering action now or bust now? And then uh, doing that repeatedly. This tree right here is pretty helpful. So this again is just an expectamax tree. And this is one way to think about 
POM DPs. Um, we're maximizing, we're choosing an action, and this is the Ghostbusters example again. We can either choose one of the squares and say the ghost is here, bust here, try to get the 250 points. Another set of actions that we have is all of the sensing actions. The busting actions take us to utility nodes, 0 or 250, whether, depending on whether we chose the right spot. And the expectation nodes take us to, or sorry, the sensing actions take us to expect nodes where we find out the result of that sensor, whether it's yellow, green, red, orange. From there, we end up at another one of the same kind of decisions again. So this is actually the algorithm that the VPI-based agent for Ghostbusters is running, is a truncated expectamax in a tree that looks like that. And when we do that, we get a more rigorous way of answering this question. So here's the VPI agent making decisions. And rather than just kind of clicking around randomly, it's actually computing the optimal place to click next to maximize the information it gets and the value of that information. It's also going to decide at what point the value of sensing more is less than the cost of sensing more, and that's when it will actually bust. I think it's waiting for me to click, yeah. So it's still exploring, but it figured it out pretty quickly. Oh, yeah. And so that's a lot smarter than what we can do without actually solving this out. Last quick slide on here, I kind of alluded to it already. The point, we don't have to get into the proof because um, it's, it's way beyond the scope of the class, but the point is we have a hierarchy of computer science problems where NP is here and problems that are in NP we think generally are really hard. That's what Jacob was talking about a couple lectures ago with inference and Bayes nets. Out here, we have P space. And things that are in P space, but not in NP, even harder than NP. Well, anything you said about this is just even more true about problems that are out here. And solving a POMDP, so one of these iterative VPI calculations like that, solving it exactly is P space complete, which means basically it's out in this section of this Venn diagram where it's not in NP. At least we think so. There are a lot of open, at, open questions about the structure of this Venn diagram, but assuming there is actually anything out here at all, POMDPs are just that much harder than traveling salesman problem, Boolean satisfiability, all these examples you see a lot of really hard problems in computer science. Okay, that's all for today. And that's my last lecture, so thank you.